I'm Dr. Eric Moore. I'm a head and neck surgeon at the Mayo Clinic, and I'm here with a patient of mine, Heidi, who has undergone parotid tumor surgery, and we're discussing topics related to parotid gland tumors and cancers and surgery. Heidi, thanks for joining us. Hi, thank you, Dr. Moore. I wanted to talk to you a little bit about people who do have a cancerous or a malignant parotid gland tumor. Um, I know that we've talked in the past that this is, you know, rare because most parotid gland tumors are benign, but there are people who find themselves in that circumstance. So right. could you explain for us what the most common types of parotid tumors are? And if we could start with MEC, could you explain what that is? Sure. So uh, to define some terms, uh, a parotid gland tumor means a growth in a parotid gland. So the surgeons and, and physicians will sometimes use that term tumor uh, to apply to a broad number of things. Mm -hmm. And tumor means growth. So tumor implies uh, some type of abnormal cell that's there, but that doesn't have to be a cancer. Mm -hmm. A malignant cancer is different than a benign tumor in that a malignant cancer has the potential to metastasize mm -hmm. or jump to another area like a lymph node or a body uh, part separate from the parotid gland without continuous spread. So the cancers of the parotid gland uh, come in both what we call low-grade, less aggressive, or high-grade, more aggressive type tumors. And one of the most common cancers of the parotid gland is a mucoepidermoid carcinoma, typically abbreviated as MEC. Mucoepidermoid carcinoma is interesting in that it's, it's heterogeneous, meaning it can also behave sort of slowly and even benignly or malignantly. So when we see a mucoepidermoid carcinoma in pathology, the first thing we ask our pathologists is, can you tell us something about the grade of that tumor? Grade means basically how abnormal those cells look under the microscope. And the high-grade tumors look less like a normal cell than the low-grade tumors. The high-grade tumors typically behave more aggressively than the low-grade tumors. So there's a big cutoff between low-grade mucoepidermoid carcinoma which we treat with complete removal, but we have very high confidence that that tumor is likely going to do well and recur very infrequently versus a high-grade mucoepidermoid carcinoma, particularly if it's spread to lymph nodes, that we then become very concerned about the fact that that tumor has a high potential for recurrence and distant spread. So the most important thing in a mucoepidermoid carcinoma to us is one, what is the grade, and two, has it spread to any lymph nodes? The last thing to know about, and this is more, uh, this is getting very technical, but sometimes that grade can be misleading. And I've had very many great pathologists say, boy, if you put three of us in a room and asked us to grade that tumor, we might differ a little mm -hmm. bit. These are very subtle changes, and it also might not be look the same throughout the whole tumor. It might depend on which portion you section. So, so. If the pathologist says it's a low-grade tumor, or maybe they, they sort of put it in the middle, an intermediate-grade tumor, I'm very interested also in has it spread to any lymph nodes. Because if it's spread to lymph nodes, even if it's a low-grade tumor, I'm getting more concerned that it's going to act aggressively. But if it's a low-grade tumor with no lymph node spread, I'm fairly convinced it's not going to act very aggressively. Okay, so one of the other common types seems to be a synic cell carcinoma. Can you explain what that is? A synic cell carcinoma is a less common uh, tumor than mucoepidermoid carcinoma. And a synic cell carcinoma is a cancerous tumor that has the potential to spread, uh, but very rarely spreads outside the parotid gland. So a synic cell carcinoma we deal with with, again, complete removal. A synic cell carcinoma I have seen be multifocal in the gland before, so we try to do a fairly complete parotid gland removal with the synic cell carcinoma because it's one of these tumors that can have some multifocality. The synic cell carcinoma has an interesting facet that it has a, a delayed recurrence rate that can be very late after the removal of the tumor. So it's one of those tumors that we do a little bit more surveillance <clears throat> on because even when everything goes well and is completely removed, we have seen these tumors recur sometimes many years later. And potentially that's that multifocality where it's actually a separate tumor that just didn't raise its head until later. And then finally, a synic cell carcinoma has a feature to it that it can de-differentiate into a more aggressive tumor. So a synic cell carcinoma with complete removal usually does well and usually doesn't require an extraordinary tumor, but we have seen these undifferentiated higher grade of synic cell carcinomas that were actually a synic cell carcinoma that changed during its time course. That can happen, as we've talked about, with pleomorphic adenoma, benign tumor turning into a malignant tumor. It can happen with a synic cell carcinoma 
uh, cancer, but fairly nice acting, turn into a more aggressive tumor with more invasive features where it can grow into things or spread later in its life. Okay, and so what about adenoid cystic carcinoma? Adenoid cystic carcinoma is a very, very, very challenging tumor to have as a patient and for us to treat as a surgeon. Adenoid cystic carcinoma is, is a salivary gland cancer that starts in the parotid gland or other salivary glands, has as its hallmarks perineural invasion. So adenoid cystic carcinoma uses nerves, both the facial nerve that moves the muscles to the face, but also sensory nerves in the area that supply touch as highways to grow along. So the typical adenoid cystic carcinoma will often spread outside the parotid gland into adjacent muscle, into areas around bone, all the way up to the base of the skull by using these nerves as a highway. And it does that very early in its course of development. So even when we see small adenoid cystic carcinomas, we get concerned that what we're seeing right there with our eyes is not the entire picture of where the tumor has gone. Because of that nerve spread, very often people with adenoid cystic carcinoma show up with pain because it's spread to sensory nerves. So they show up with facial paralysis as their presenting symptom uh, because it's spread along those nerves. And finally, adenoid cystic carcinoma has a very, very, very long-term uh, growth rate. By that I mean I've seen patients with adenoid cystic carcinoma who 15, 20, 25 years later can have a recurrence. It's one of these tumors that we really don't think we're totally out of the woods for life, which can be a very, very challenging thing to live with. On a positive note, people can live with adenoid cystic carcinoma almost as a chronic disease for a long, long, long period of our life. So it's not, it's not one of these tumors that causes death, uh, at least not very early in its course of growth, uh, but can, the patient can live with it for quite a long time. And finally, adenoid cystic carcinoma has a very interesting predilection to spread to the lungs. So oftentimes this is late, sometimes 15, 20 years later after people develop adenoid cystic carcinoma that will look at imaging, chest CTs, chest x-rays of their lungs and see all of these nodules of adenoid cystic carcinoma in there. And the patient may have absolutely no symptoms or no idea that it's there. It has these multiple small spreads to the lung that can very often be asymptomatic. Okay, so you talked about how this tumor could potentially spread to the lungs, but that's pretty rare though, is that correct? I'd say it's common, but it's not common early. Uh, so okay. it, it's a late finding of adenoid cystic carcinoma. But is it rare and like for all parotid tumors? Because I think like one of the things I talked to you about was, okay, now I had this tumor in my parotid gland. Am I at risk of having a tumor develop in some other part of my body now because I had this tumor? Very uncommon for other parotid tumors okay. to do this. It's a hallmark of adenoid cystic carcinoma that is not typical of other parotid tumors. Okay, and I think the final most common type of parotid gland tumor uh, would be the carcinoma expleomorphic adenoma. Can you explain what that is? Yes, yeah, so this is this is one of the main reasons why people why we remove why we uh, encourage people to remove benign parotid tumors. So oftentimes people have a parotid tumor and they might have a biopsy or an opinion by someone and find out it's benign and be very reassured and say, oh, I don't need to do anything about this. We, we disagree with that notion for two reasons. One, the benign pleomorphic adenoma will usually grow and just become more challenging to deal with as a lump on the face and more difficult to treat. But there's a small number of these tumors that <clears throat> de-differentiate or change into a malignant tumor called a carcinoma pleomorphic adenoma. And carcinoma pleomorphic adenoma is a very, very difficult tumor to treat. It's a cancer and it's difficult to cure. So the best way to treat that cancer is to prevent it from ever happening, and the best way to prevent it from ever happening is dealing with that benign pleomorphic adenoma before it ever turns into that carcinoma ex pleomorphic adenoma. Carcinoma ex pleomorphic adenoma has a lot of lymph nodes spread commonly right away. It's a very fast acting tumor. It can spread distantly, difficult tumor to treat, so easier tumor to prevent. Great. Um, why are there so many different tumor types in the parotid gland? Tumors start uh, and th these names that we're giving them uh, denote what cell type they, they originate in, and there are a lot of different cell types in the parotid gland. Mm -hmm. So the parotid gland has these gland cells that produce saliva. It has these duct cells that carry the saliva from the parotid gland as a tubule or, or, or subway system into the mouth. 
Uh, you can form tumors of those duct cells. You can form tumors of the gland cells. You can form tumors of the connective tissue cells that hold all that together. So it's a very multicellular organ, and because of that, multiple different tumor types can arise. So then what are the treatment options then if somebody has a malignant parotid tumor? Is it the same as the benign tumor where you do radiation, or is there some other option that people have? The factors that determine that are the type of tumor, the extent of tumor, and by that I mean is it just in the parotid gland or has it spread other places in the body, has it spread outside the parotid gland to the surrounding muscle, blood vessels, bone, has it gone into the facial nerve, has it metastasized to lymph nodes, has it spread distantly in the body. And all those factors individually determine the, the, the treatment, but ideally and usually the treatment is complete removal of all visible and microscopic tumor that we can find, and that involves a surgical procedure, followed by, if it's one of these more aggressive that we talked about, high grade, spread to lymph nodes, spread other places type body, radiation therapy in addition to the surgical removal to treat the microscopic cells there that might be left behind after that surgical removal. And sometimes chemotherapy drugs. We're learning every day more about parotid tumors. Why don't we already know everything about parotid tumors? Well, it turns out that as a tumor type, they're, they're very unusual, they're very individual behaving, unlike other tumor types in the body, and they're not all that common compared to something like lung cancer or colon cancer. So we just haven't poured enough research and money and things into figuring out how these tumors behave at a molecular level and at a genetic level, what are some of the possible causes from them, and every day we're developing new treatments and drugs called targeted therapy that intervene at that level, and we're finding that many of these drugs are helpful for a lot of these parotid gland aggressive cancers. So very often we're involving our medical oncologists now to employ chemotherapy and immunotherapy as a treatment also for parotid gland cancers. And has chemotherapy been effective towards treating some of these parotid tumors? I'd say historically and generally no. Uh, that's why we haven't used it a whole lot, but uh, that's uh, I'm changing my answer pretty much every week based on, on new things that we're learning uh, about these drugs. Okay, so I think um, if someone has a tumor that is malignant, you had mentioned earlier, um, maybe in one of our previous videos, that they will have periodic scans so that you can monitor that situation. So how long can somebody expect to have these scans and what type of scans are they gonna have? Mm -hmm. uh, surveillance is the tomb that we use for trying to figure out what's happening down the road after treatment. And surveillance is a combination of uh, having the patient tell us what's going on, doing a physical examination and feeling the area and looking at the nerves and feeling the neck for lymph nodes and, and um, then finally imaging. And imaging is a way to look into the body uh, and, and find the things that we can't feel because they're too deep or too small uh, or that we, we would never be able to feel because they're inside something like the lungs uh, uh, which we couldn't examine by physical exam. The frequency of all those things hinges on what is the suspicion of something coming back, what's reasonable uh, for the patient. Uh, we're, in a, we're in an era where we have to pay for every single thing that's delivered, so we're cost conscious about, about we can't just order tests because it would be a good thing, nice thing to have. We have to order tests with a suspicion of how they're gonna help us and change. And putting all of that together, we come up with a plan for how frequently we're going to do visits in the office, how frequently we're going to do scans, and what is that surveillance schedule going to look like. And typically, it's intense up front and tends to taper off towards the back end once we're more confident that these tumors aren't going to come back, with a few exceptions of those tumors that I say can recur very, very late and we're never out of the woods, at which point we might do uh, surveillance visits and some imaging for life. Okay, so um, there are a lot of people who find themselves in a circumstance in which they have a malignant tumor and then it's surgically removed and they're in this situation where they have to make a decision on whether they're just going to watch the situation or if they're going to have radiation as a preventative measure. So what are some of the factors that you think that people should consider if they find themselves in that situation? 
So the, the biggest factor is, is what happened with the initial treatment and what is the suspicion that something's going to come back. And we typically will employ additional treatments based on the higher the suspicion we get that something's going to come back and, and then based on data that doing that additional th treatment is going to lower that chance of it coming back. And for some tumors and for some people, we might say any chance that that tumor is going to come back. If we have a way to influence that by doing additional therapy like radiation therapy, we're going to do it. For other tumors, we might sort of make a value judgment with that patient saying, it's got this chance of coming back, doing radiation therapy will change it to this chance, but we're going to take on these side effects or something like that and help that patient make a decision, yes, I'm going to do that, and no, I'm not going to do that. And you'd think that would be just an absolute black or white decision, but I find very often in my practice, that's a very individual decision. And if I was going to guide a patient, I would lean heavily on their physician, and I would ask them the question, what would you do if you were me? What would you do if I was your brother, sister, family member? Um, and very often, an experienced person will tell you exactly what they would do, and very often that's probably based on the most evidence and, and data uh, that, that could possibly be obtained. And so we, we use our colleagues, uh, we, we think of these tumors as, as requiring multidisciplinary treatment. You need the help of a surgeon, you need the help of a radiation oncologist, you need the help of a medical oncologist, you need the help of emotional support, you need a physical therapist, you need all these people on your team. And, and, and if you can find a good team where everybody's talking to each other and helping you make that value judgment, then you probably won. Okay, great. Thank you so much. I think that's going to be really helpful to people who find themselves in this really scary situation of having cancer and this, you know, multidisciplinary approach or team approach with the patient included will help people, you know, make valid and sound decisions for their own medical care. That's my pleasure. These are great questions and you yeah. got right to the heart of the matter. Yeah. Thanks.